Thank you all so much for joining us today and tuning in to our December 2022 lobby training number one, planning your legislative plan by member of Congress segment. We are so honored to have you join this week's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and today's session is actually a joint training with the wonderful liaison program that Amy Bennett, the Director of Congressional Lobby Days and Congressional Liaisons runs. And so I'm gonna pass it to Amy in just a little bit. I'm just letting people know that today we're gonna to be joined by pretty much the whole suite of CCL's Government Affairs Department to participate in strategizing for our upcoming December lobby meetings. To get more information on what our strategy and meeting asks will be and have time to really explore by segment and get questions answered by CCL's Government Affairs team. Now, this is the first of two recommended trainings for any CCL volunteer planning on being a part of their group's December 2022 lobby meetings. The next training will be after the election on November 10th lobby training number two, and we'll update our primary and supporting asks heading into our December lobby drive. And, and our learning goals for today are the following. If we've done our job well, you're going to walk away understanding more about your congressional member segment. You're going to have the chance to consider your member and what messages will resonate with advice from our DC team. And you also understand how CCL strategy fits within your members segment. So with that, I'll pass it to Amy who's going to introduce Jen and start our training off. Thank you all so much for being here. So I would like to um, introduce uh, Jennifer Tyler, who is our Senior Director of Government Affairs. Now behind the scenes, many of you don't know that you come to me with a question and often I cannot figure it out and I go right to Jen. And then we either she gets back to you or I get back to you. She is the one who can really help guide us on those sticky questions that um, where we just don't quite know what to do. We know it's a little bit more complicated than what we're able to understand. And she has just been awesome uh, working with me and you all on answering some of those questions. And she is going to frame this up for us before we go into the lobby meeting. So Jen, take it away. Thanks so much, Amy. And uh, I love being on these calls. Some of my favorite calls uh, to be on. We'll start briefly with just a legislative update to kind of encapsulate where we are right now. Congress is out of session. They're all back in their districts, in their states, campaigning if they're up for re-election or helping others campaign, um, but there's no ongoing legislative work. We left before Congress left session and went to recess dealing with the permitting reform bill. That was the big subject for a, a couple of weeks there, and it was a pretty quick process. Manchin and Schumer you know, had a permitting reform bill that they introduced um, in a matter of days, that bill was taken out of the CR, which is the continuing resolution, the funding bill that they had to pass by the end of September to keep the government funded. It did not get included ultimately because of some opposition amongst both Republicans, but also amongst some of the progressive Democrats and, and rank and file Democrats as well. So there are some concerns about that bill, but the subject of permitting reform is going to be here to stay. There's a big issue in terms of getting a lot of this clean energy to houses, to businesses, getting it transmitted. So that's the issue it's trying to solve. Um, there were some good things in that bill and there's some resources on community. There were also some things we didn't love, but needless to say, it's gonna be a topic that's gonna keep coming up. We will see when they get back in session after the election, whether they try to keep pushing this permitting reform bill. Manchin has been clear he would like it taken up by the end of the year, so we will stay tuned to that. But they also have a pretty busy schedule. They still have to pass another government funding bill. So they funded the government for a whopping couple of months. Um, so they'll have to fund the government, hopefully more fully to probably next September. They also have to pass the big defense authorization bill that they pass annually that funds all of DOD and a bunch of other defense expenses. And there's some other remaining issues. Legalizing same-sex marriage is a big vote that might come up. There's a few other things. So. They've got a pretty packed slate, but permitting reform, a big climate uh, bill might be a part of that. We'll have to just wait and see until after the election. So that's the legislative update. On to these breakout segments. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these because we did them at the June conference and they were a huge, huge success. 
Uh, we're going to be breaking up into four segments today, Senate Democrats, Senate Republicans, House Democrats, and House Republicans. So why do we do this? Why do we break it down? You know, most fly-ins, most organizations that do lobby days, it's one ask for every single member, every single senator, the same messaging. Uh, and that's because a lot of people, you know, the people they have coming in aren't as well educated. They're not as clued in on who their member is. But you guys are really savvy. You know, we, we thought about it and it's very clear you, you were already doing this differentiation on your own. You are already looking at what resonates with your member, what are their political concerns, what's their district like. So we just want to build on that. We want to help get into some of the weeds of who these members are, help make us even more effective than we already are in our lobbying strategies by using that kind of political background and what's going on within each caucus within Congress. Um, and there is variation. I'll acknowledge, you know, House Republicans, that's a wide ranging group and Senate Republicans, Senate Democrats, it's, it's a pretty broad group, but there are some consistencies. So this is a good place for us to start talking broadly about who each of these groups are, what messages work with them, what should we be talking about in our November, December lobby day. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to chat. We'll have some Q&A. So think of questions that are particular to your member that you think other people in the group might be having as well. And we'll try to address all of those. We aren't gonna have a primary ask just yet. Um, we are, as Amy said, going to have a CCU after the election where we will tell you exactly what the primary ask is. But as I laid out before, there's a little bit up in the air as to what Congress is working on after the election. So that's why we don't have that ask just yet. But these breakout segments are going to tell you exactly the direction to go. So if you're meeting before that lobby day, maybe your members are retiring, we'll point you in the right direction. What should you be talking about? What should your asks be? And a few things I want to flag before we head into the breakouts just trying to frame what these members are thinking about, what we should be thinking about as we go in. The first one is the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, we passed the largest climate bill in the history of the world. And so a lot of these members, senators, everyone are gonna be thinking, well, we just did that huge thing. And they're gonna have different perspectives on that. Either they liked the bill or they didn't. Um, for us, obviously a tremendous success. And it's gonna to lead to so much progress on the fight we've been, we've been trying to make for, for years and years. That being said, we still have work to do. So we're gonna to try to hone in on that remaining about 10% of emissions reductions that we need to get to by 2030. That's part of why we have to go back to the hill. We have to keep fighting because it didn't get the job done, but it made tremendous strides. And lastly, Congress isn't done yet. So we're still gonna be fighting for those that last 10% of emissions reductions. We're gonna be talking about carbon pricing. We're gonna be focusing on the things we focused on for 15 years now. Um, but we're also going to try to get done what we can in these remaining couple of months of the Congress. So there's some key supporting asks that we have outstanding that are moving through committees. They have the chance to pass Congress, and we just want to get those across the finish line. All right. Thank you so much, Jen, for that very helpful walkthrough. And with that, we'll actually transition into each of our four breakouts by segment for your member of Congress. A note to those listening in later if you know your segment, you can skip ahead of the video to the timestamp that represents what your member of Congress and their segment is. And with that, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Everybody for joining us today. Um, really glad to be here. Um, I know that we had this and I did the Senate Democrats breakout in June. So you may have uh, had heard some of this from me then. Uh, but if not, you know, welcome. And if you are welcome back. Um, I, I'm really excited to be here with you all, and I look forward to your questions at the tail end. So um, I'm going to go ahead and run through uh, the kind of prepared uh, work we have for you, and then uh, we'll take questions. So um, just a quick couple of reminders at the top. Um, you know, we're focusing on the 117th Congress, and you know, later in the year, as we as we said, um, we'll have focus trainings on the new members of Congress and, and what that Congress might look like as well as post-election, we'll be able to get a better sense of, you know, politically what's feasible and what this Congress will do, uh, you know, likely do for the remainder of, of the Congress. So with that, I'll jump into um, our conversation. So, you know, Senate Democrats have accomplished, well, and I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm Kyle Kameen, for those of you that don't know, um, manager of stakeholder affairs, uh, stakeholder engagement and government affairs. I've been with CCL for about two years now. Um, on our government affairs team, and I focus on our work on the Hill and building relationships with um, industries and associations here in DC, kind of move the ball forward where we can on our shared climate priorities. Um, 
you know, Senate Democrats ha have accomplished a ton this year with regard to climate legislation, um, in, really in the last two years. On the bipartisan front, they generally supported the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, the Growing Climate Solutions Act, the CHIPS Act, and there are 49 senators, you know, ready to go for to support a car carbon price. Um, their support ultimately resulted in the Inflation Reduction Act, which, as Jen just you know, said, is the largest climate bill in history and could reduce emissions by up to 40% below 2005 levels. All of that said, there is still more climate success that can be accomplished in this Congress, including the RISE Act and NCARS. However, as we think about that, there are generally three sets, uh, subsets of Democratic senators in the conference. Um, there are 10 to 15 members that are leaders on climate. They're going to actively seek out opportunities to introduce bills and to and collaborate across policy areas. You know who those leaders are. We hear from them a lot. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Coons, and, and several others um, who you know, are always looking to find what is that next step they can take on climate. And we can expect that they're going to continue that effort through the end of this Congress. They're going to be on board to pursue additional climate wins. Then there are probably less than 10 very progressive members for whom climate is absolutely a priority, um, but they're less likely to support bipartisan solutions. You know, we've seen some of this over time. Um, and the, even those solutions that maybe the majority of Democrats in the conference support, and they may even voice opposition. It doesn't always mean they'll vote against a certain policy, but they may voice opposition. Something to consider in that, with regard to that group is that after the negotiations for the IRA, and the difficult process that the uh, conference went through to get that bill passed, they may be less likely to compromise on certain climate priorities moving forward. The remaining members, kind of your rank and file Democrats in the Senate, will support bipartisan climate legislation when it's brought to the floor and will only really lead or voice concern when there is a direct connection to their state that's either beneficial or they see as harmful to their state. So most of the messaging that you're going to see from CCL and the grassroots advocacy uh, state opportunities that we'll provide you, you know, leading up to um, and through the remainder of this Congress um, will be around NCARS and the RISE Act will be applicable to the entire conference. In the long term, it's important to keep in mind that CCL is still going to need to push for a carbon price and find a bipartisan path forward on speeding up and building the green infrastructure that we need to hit the emissions targets we all know are so needed. More bipartisan climate wins now will continue to build the bipartisan political will to get things done and agreement on climate generally moving forward. So what should you be thinking about when working with these members? There are a couple of key bullets. One of those is that, as Jen said, a lot of members are gonna feel like they did what they could on climate and that there isn't much or any more that can be done after the IRA. The second bullet to that is this makes it all the more important that we remind those, the, those Senate Democrats in particular that they can still accomplish more in this Congress and that by passing the RISE Act and NCARS, they can continue to make progress on needed climate legislation. Messages that are going to work for those members are obviously we want to appreciate what they've done. We want to give them some affirmation for the tremendous amount of effort that went into making the climate progress they did make, right? And that's in the meeting saying nice things and, and letting them know that we appreciate with all the work that they've done, but also LTEs, op-eds, and, and whatever else we can do uh, to show them our appreciation. And, and I know many of you are already working on this. Your chapters and, and your fellow volunteers are, are doing this every day. And we just need to keep that kind of drumbeat going. As a general rule, we can assume that they're going to feel like they took the opportunity on climate, but we want to remind them that they can still accomplish more. They can still do more and that it's right there in front of them to be done. And last but not least, the, what ties into that point there is that they need to hear from you, their constituents, that despite their progress, despite the wonderful accomplishments of recent months, climate remains a priority for you as a constituent and a voter. Continue to tell them that, yes, you did a great job, but there's more that needs to be done. This problem isn't solved. We can do more together, and it remains a priority for me as your constituent and voter.
So how can we do this? You know, what are, what are we asking from these members? Well, we want to make sure that we recognize the importance of meeting President Biden's emissions reduction pledge, right? The IRA isn't going to do that by itself. Um, and so we want to push to get more as much done in this Congress as possible to reach those emissions reductions targets. Now that reconciliation is finished, we want to push to get a couple of smaller climate wins across the finish line before the end of the Congress. When it comes to NCARS, it's past committee and it needs co-sponsors to get across the finish line. This is an opportunity for your senator, if they aren't already a co-sponsor, to get on board and help push that across the finish line. The RISE Act is in a similar position. It is also past committee and needs additional co-sponsors to get across the finish line. So there are opportunities here for them to lead and help get these wins across the finish line. Furthermore, because of the great focus that the IRA required from members and their staff, they may not be aware of a, these pieces of climate legislation that are moving or have been introduced. They still might need to be pushed to vote on legislation that isn't their first choice and also wasn't right in front of them for many, many months uh, to be you know, debated and, uh, and evaluated. So those are the kinds of things that we can ask our members to do to continue to move the ball forward um, on, the climate, uh, on, climate, on the climate front. All right, so we'll get going. We've got some slides to, to follow along with here. Um, I am Jen, a Senior Director of Gov Affairs. Glad to be talking about Senate Republicans. We'll dive in first and we'll talk a bit about who um, these members are, who, what kind of resonates with most of these members. And most Senate Republicans all believe that climate change is real. Uh, they think it's largely driven by human activity. They acknowledge that and they're open to federal action to address it. They also are willing to support bipartisan action. They obviously support Republican only action, but many of them are open to bipartisan uh, deals on climate, energy policy, all of that. There are some that are gonna be leaders on the issues, the names we think of in the, in the Republican space that we work with a lot when you think of Murkowski, um, Collins, Romney, some of the more outspoken Senate Republicans. Uh, and a few, are, a few are gonna oppose almost all action um, and they oppose almost everything else as well. Uh, but most are somewhere in the middle. Most are not champions. They're also not, you know, stringent opponents to, to climate action. They're just somewhere in the middle there. And most of our messaging and grassroots advocacy guidance are going to be applicable to the whole conference. We're not, you know, we'll obviously talk individually with some of you about specific messages that resonate with one senator over the other. But generally, for Senate Republicans, there's going to be a consistent message that we can hone in on for all of them. So what should you be thinking about when you're working with these types of members? Um, you know, near term, a focus on the supporting asks. Again, when I was giving my intro, I laid out this context that we're currently in with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, just passing. And that was a huge, uh, it created a lot of tension. Any reconciliation bill, which is a partisan bill, is gonna create that tension between the parties because one party is able to push through a reconciliation bill. Republicans did that with the big tax, Cuts in Jobs Act when uh, in the previous under the previous administration, Democrats have done that with a couple of COVID bills. So it just naturally creates tension. But this particularly with the timing leading up to an election really kind of heated up that debate. So right now we want to kind of back off of talking about inflation reduction. You know, we're still going to talk about climate. We have to keep moving these Senate Republicans forward, but we want to do it in a constructive way. They might be fuming about the IRA. They might be fuming about other things. We want to talk to them about things that will they can act on right now that are not super touchy, sensitive bills, but are still going to make meaningful contributions to reducing emissions. So that's where the supporting asks come in. And there's some that we really, they're moving. We just need to help push them over the finish line. Long term, we're still going to focus on our major asks. So we're going to think about carbon pricing. How do we sell that more to Republicans? Part of that is focusing on CBAMs, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, the trade angle to carbon pricing. How can we work that into our conversation? How does that open a door for a Republican to talk more about a carbon price um, without directly talking about a carbon price? They're able to talk about China and all of these other countries they want to level the playing field with um, while you know talking about a carbon price without realizing it. So it's a really interesting time for us to have those conversations um, and that's going to pick up more next Congress. We also long term want to be focusing on natural carbon sequestration. We're starting with forests. We have already done a lot on that. We've got a supporting ask on forests. 
Um, but Republicans are getting more and more engaged on this issue. It's an issue that, frankly, Republicans have led on more in Congress than Democrats, just naturally by their interest in um, conservation, energy, farm, ag, all of that. They've got more bills out there on this stuff than Democrats do. So we want to really capitalize on that and push them even further with a focus on the emissions reduction side of it. And lastly, building the clean energy economy faster. That's another big focus area of ours that we'll kick off with more next Congress. Permitting reform falls into there. We've got all this clean energy. How do we get it um, into houses and businesses? And Republicans are actively looking at that. The Mansion permitting reform bill is touchy because again, it's a democratic bill, but we saw Republicans put out their own permitting reform bill in September. So it shows they're thinking about it. They were willing to drop a bill uh, with with McC McConnell on it as well. So they're serious about it. We're going to have those conversations. We're going to figure out some good bipartisan bills in the space that we can act on. But again, in the short term, what resonates right now with all the tensions, the election is going to be those supporting asks that we'll get into. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about the messages that resonate with these members. You know, as I said, Republicans are willing, Senate Republicans are willing to engage on this. Um, and they're going to be key to future climate victories. We've got to have them on board to get these big bipartisan bills across the finish line. But we also have to recognize they're not going to vote like Democrats. So we need to really cater our messaging, change it, um, and make it fit these particular senators. So the first, highlighting that bipartisan climate action. You know, the IRA passed, that's a big victory for us, but that's not a victory for them. We don't want to go in there talking about this big bill, this great bill that passed. We want to talk about bipartisan climate action that they can get behind, things that have their buy-in and that they are working on from the get-go. That's a huge part for Senate Republicans. We also wanna tie any climate uh, impacts or any climate legislation to local impacts. Republicans across the board, that's the way to talk to them about climate. Flooding, hurricanes, wildfires, whatever business impacts, whatever it might be, figure out what's meaningful to them. And that's where your conversations need to start pro-business message. So obviously economy, inflation, all of those issues are super important right now to Senate Republicans. We want to use those messages and tie it back to our climate priorities. And we also want to make sure we're hitting that competitiveness angle. I talked about CBAMs and how, you know, Republicans are talking all the time about China and Russia and all of these major countries that we want to compete against. Um, it's a very easy thing to do to bring climate into that conversation. Uh, many of them are already doing it. A couple of things we don't want to do. I mentioned the IRA. We don't want to sell them on that. Um, and we don't, also don't want to pit clean energy against fossil fuels. Senate Republicans aren't all of the above uh, energy solutions uh, group, of, group of individuals. So they just want everything. Um, they're not going to say we want solar over fossil fuels. So we shouldn't bring that message to them, even if that's generally what we want. All right, so let's get to the to the meat of this. What are our asks? Again, we don't have a primary ask right now just because we're waiting to see what happens with the election. But for now, a few things I wanna point you guys to. Um, supporting asks, like I mentioned. So the Forest Act is a really important bill. We're not expecting this one to move this Congress. That being said, we are expecting it to be reintroduced in January. And the goal of getting more co-sponsors on that bill is that it will be reintroduced with a bunch of co-sponsors and can move pretty quickly. We particularly need Republican, more Republican buy-in on that bill. And it, frankly, it's a, it's a great bill right up their alley um, dealing with a lot of those, those trade issues, making sure that American businesses are not competing against foreign businesses that are illegally deforesting um, their areas. So that the American cattle producers is on board, a bunch of American business associations are supportive of a bill for that reason. NCARS, the National Climate Adaptation Resiliency Bill, that bill has moved through a Senate committee. So we've got movement, it's, it's, it's going somewhere. We just need to get it to pass the Senate and pass the House. Um, this we are hoping will be rolled into an end of year spending bill. So as I mentioned before, Congress has to fund the government again um, through hopefully the next fiscal year in December. We're hoping that this bill will be tacked on to that big spending bill. In order to do that, what we're hearing from the, the sponsors of the bill and the leadership in the Senate and the House is that we need to get more co-sponsors. So it's already moved through a Senate committee. It had Republican support in that committee, a few Republican no votes, um, but by and large Republican support. 
So we can use that talking point um, and sell that to more Senate Republicans so they can co-sponsor it and take credit for something that frankly, if it's, if it's gonna pass, which we are very hopeful, they should get their name on it now. Um, so they can really take credit for it as someone who got on the board early. And the RISE Act, the RISE Act has also moved. It's moved through a Senate committee with Republican support. It's a great bill, particularly for some of these coastal states uh, that have a potential for offshore wind, but it res it's important every state. It's got a lot of impacts on the land and, uh, land and water conservation fund. It's got some other impacts on state funding. So there's a way to make this applicable to any Senator, but particularly if you've got a coastal Republican member Senator, you really wanna hit on this RISE Act bill. Again, it passed the committee. So we just wanna get it across the full Senate and then through the house. And then longer term, as I mentioned, we've got those larger topics, which for this next lobby day, you know, we're not gonna go in with an ask on carbon pricing, obviously, um, but, you know, if you had a conversation that left off, there were questions unanswered, I definitely think it's all right to have those conversations. We do wanna focus on these supporting asks just because of how critical those are gonna be to get across the finish line. They're already moving. We just gotta get them through. Um, but if you've got some loose ends that are not tied up or you've got some questions to figure out where things stand with the member, um, then it's a good time to ask those questions. And lastly, we really wanna protect the progress we've already made. So. Thinking forward, we are going to have to defend the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, this meeting is not a time to do that, to sell them on it, but it's a time to pay clear attention to what they're saying on the IRA. Are they saying there's a specific thing they didn't like? There's, was it just the process? Is it just that it's a partisan bill or is there a specific portion of the bill they don't like? Whatever they offer to you, take note of that because we are going to have to next Congress figure out a way to really defend the IRA and use whatever is true to that particular Senate Republican, use that to figure out what is our answer to them on that? How can we convince them that not necessarily the whole bill, but there are provisions within the bill that they can support and would like to keep so that when there are votes to repeal in the House, should the Republicans take over, uh, we have Senate Republicans who are willing to stand behind the bill, not necessarily take credit for it or or say it loud and proud, but they're not willing to vote to repeal the bill. So just pay clear attention. Again, you're not bringing up the IRA in the meeting or trying to sell them on it, but just being aware of what they offer you in terms of what are their concerns right now? What is their opposition? What is, what's frustrating them? So we can take that to heart and then use that for some of our messaging and our lobbying next Congress. So I All right, um, so hello everyone. My name is Hardy Alms, and I am a government affairs coordinator here at CCL. And today we're going to be going over House Democrats for this climate advocacy training. Um, so first and foremost, uh, we'd like to take care of some housekeeping, um, starting with a word on confidentiality. So an important part of our work with members of Congress is that we're able to keep a standard of confidentiality when it comes to our meetings. So making sure that information which is shared in these meetings stays confidential is important to building trust and maintaining relationships with these MOCs. We point this out to remind you to not specifically share member information during these breakouts and training sessions. So rather to keep to general statements regarding your members or information which is a matter of public record. Next, I'd like to remind you of the context in which you'll be engaging uh, congressional Democrats. So with this Congress came the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which put a $369 billion investment towards our country's decarbonization goals of 50% emissions reductions from 2005 levels by the year 2030. So, while this was a huge step in the right direction, we cannot let things stop here. More work needs to be done and Congress must act to help us meet our climate goals. In the short term, you can work towards this goal by helping to push one of our supporting asks across the finish line and doing so will be beneficial to the climate while continuing to help you cultivate relationships with your members of Congress in service of our long-term goals of enacting carbon pricing at the federal level. Also, I understand that folks will have questions. 
and we'll be monitoring those in the chat after this before having a Q&A period. For simplicity's sake, however, um, I would like to direct you to an FAQ document that we put together. Um, and that should be in the chat. If it's not, I can put it in now. Um, and so please check this to see if your question is there uh, prior to putting your question in the chat or raising your hand on Zoom, just for simplicity's sake. And now I think we should be on to slide four, good. Uh, so next I'd like to set some general parameters for this discussion. Specifically, what are House Democrats and what is their importance when it comes to climate legislation? So House Democrats view federal action on climate change as a top priority. They are eager to support meaningful climate solutions. They hope to address environmental justice concerns through climate action. And for some, this is a central component of their views on climate policy. But for others, while it's important, it's not their top motivator. And to be broad, there are generally two subsets on climate within the category of House Democrats. So the first is a group of members who will actively seek out opportunities to introduce bills and opportunities to collaborate across climate policy areas. Now, the second consists of those who are considered moderate, who have perhaps more nuanced positions on climate policy. And they will usually support climate legislation when it is brought to the floor, but only after consideration of the impact on their district, um, things like industry, agriculture, and their impacts on the American household. These members will usually only lead on climate policies when there is a direct connection to their district. Now, next we'd like to address a few questions concerning your, alert, your work lobbying House Democrats. And next slide. And so what should you, the volunteers, be keeping in mind when working with these members? So most of these members have, they've been working on climate legislation for some time. Many of them co-sponsor various climate bills. And a lot of these members feel that they are already there on climate and don't need to be lobbied on climate action. So in their mind, getting Republicans to move on the issue is the problem, not them. Some of these members have a more cautious approach. They're concerned about the economic and political impacts of far left aggressive climate policies. Conversely, others feel as if we are moving too slowly on climate, that the scope and the severity of the problem requires sweeping and immediate change at much greater scale than do their colleagues. Next slide. So moving into another big question, what messages resonate with these members? First of all, we should be starting these meetings with a thank you. Most of the members in this segment supported the bipartisan infrastructure package, uh, Build Back Better back when that was a thing, and more recently, the Inflation Reduction Act um, as a priority this past Congress, or this current Congress, I should say. And these were great achievements. Put together, the actions of this Congress represent the single largest legislative step towards decarbonization that we have ever made as a country. Despite this, though, some members are still taking political hits from their votes for these bills. Uh, progressives are being hit on concerns over environmental justice that the bill didn't go far enough, while moderates face fiscal responsibility questions and other attacks from the political right. All this is to say that a simple thank you to start the meeting will go a long way. They will appreciate the thank yous and they want to hear that they are doing the right thing on climate. Um, you can simply look up your member's congressional page and this will help you learn their story and will help you uh, connect with them prior to the meeting. Also, when talking to your members, it's important to know that they genuinely feel that they are not at the center of needing to be convinced on climate. They are already convinced of the effects of climate change and would like to see action. So we need to show that rather than preaching to the choir that we are trying to impress upon them 
uh, the salience and the importance of this issue to their constituents. Along these lines, it'll be important in building off of the IRA to in turn protect it from repeal, ensure that it gets implemented as effectively as possible, and to expand upon it in order to meet nation's emissions goals. And next slide. So what is our ask, uh, what are our goals with these members? So first of all, presuming that they voted for it, we would like to thank them, as I've said, for their work in helping to pass the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, meeting the president's goal of a 50% reduction below 2005 emissions by 2030 is very important, obviously, for the climate. While the Inflation Reduction Act is a great start, expert modeling has estimated that it will only get us to 40% reductions, meaning that we still need that additional 10% to meet the president's goals. With the current makeup of the Supreme Court, we cannot rely on executive action or regulations to help us meet this pledge. So Congress must act to accomplish this goal. Now, it is here that you can remind your members that long-term, we are still pushing for carbon price as the best policy vehicle to help us achieve these emissions reductions. However, in the short term, which will be this upcoming meeting, um, there are still climate wins that these members can help achieve during this Congress. Uh, some of these wins include the passage of the Growing Climate Solutions Act and the National Climate Adaptation and Resilience Strategy Act, or NCARS. Try to make an emotional connection with your MOCs to understand that their constituents continue to want to see action on climate policy. One way to do this is by sharing stories, and stories are an opportunity to make yourself memorable to MOCs. You want them to remember your, remember your name. You want to have urgency telling them about a person or a place. Um, and in closing, the president's Paris Agreement pledge needs to be met. Um, over the course of your meetings, it's going to be a busy time on the Hill. And it's important to let your members know that climate should be one of their priorities within the coming months. And that pretty much covers everything that I have to talk about. Um, Okay, so let's jump in. Uh, today, this is the breakout room for House Republicans, of course. Um, you all know that. Uh, my name is Jamari Hartley. Uh, I'm CCL's Government Affairs Coordinator. Um, today, uh, we will be discussing various questions uh, pertaining to House Republicans and what we can do best to make communications with the office positive this, coming up, uh, this upcoming lobby season. Um, so let's get into House Republicans. Uh, so these members have uh, varying views of climate change, with some firmly believing that it is real, uh, largely driven by human activity, and must be addressed by federal policy, and others dismissing its existence altogether. Generally, they are pretty keen on market-based solutions and all of the above energy policies, uh, mainly with a focus on reducing federal uh, regulations. Uh, there is a divide within the conference, uh, especially in the House, between moderate Republicans who are eager to develop bipartisan climate and environmental solutions and conservatives who are often opposed to climate action and focus on, on energy independence. Moderate Republicans frequently break from their party on various policy issues, including occasionally supporting stringent environmental regulations and mandates. Uh, there are roughly 30 to 35 House moderate Republicans, uh, with the rest of the Republican conference in the House uh, being more conservative, conservative and uh, their approaches to climate issues uh, are usually skepticism or outright denial. Um, so getting to the main questions, uh, what uh, should you all be thinking about when working with these members uh, in your upcoming lobby meetings? Uh, first, uh, in the near term, a focus on the supporting us are, th are things a lot of these Republicans should be able to get behind um, and where we should be putting a lot of our effort. Uh, just because uh, these things are things that they should support 
uh, it doesn't mean that they will without uh, strong support and efforts uh, from advocates like CCL. Uh, there are still some pieces of legislation that we can get past this Congress, uh, such as the RISE Act um, and NCARS and some of our other uh, secondary asks. Um, even after the big wins with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, these members of Congress can play an important role in advancing these important supporting asks uh, that will continue to build a foundation for greater action in the future. Um, Long-term wise, uh, several re Republican senators uh, and, and House members have expressed support for exploring a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, and this is certainly a big move and of course, a key component of an eventual carbon price. Um, so it's extremely important um, moving forward that it is um, something that we can uh, work and discuss with our members. Uh, remember, um, even though there are headwinds when it comes to climate, uh, we have seen House Republicans move on climate in, in the past, last couple of years. Uh, they have been more engaged on climate in the past couple of years than they have ever been before. Um, and it, now it's becoming a major election issue. Uh, House Republicans are going to be uh, key to future climate victories. Uh, we believe it is really important to create a positive feedback loop uh, for getting them to walk faster in the direction of greater climate action. We want climate action no matter what party is in power, and a good way to achieve this is to acknowledge when progress is made. Uh, remember to keep in mind that we are seeing real progress, uh, but we don't expect them to vote just, just like Democrats. Um, next, next slide, Todd. Next, next slide as well. Oh, I think you can go back in that case. Not on questions yet. Um, next, next question we have is uh, what messages resonate with these members? Uh, one message is appreciation for what they have done already on climate, uh, particularly bipartisan action like the bipartisan bipartisan infrastructure uh, investment and jobs act bill. Uh, the importance of meaningful bipartisan climate action uh, addresses local impacts. Um, and another message that resonates is pro-business uh, action that is beneficial to American in interests uh, on a global scale. Um, it is important to mention actions that the Republican Party is also doing in response to climate change, uh, notably the Energy, Climate and Conservation, the ECC task force created by Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Um, this is uh, kind of the broad spectrum of the Republican Party, and it's something that leadership is pushing. Um, so it, it's it's a step in the right direction for House Republicans, especially because this is uh, most likely, um, you, you know, this is the uh, House minority leader um, and what their party is pushing. Um, it is also important to note and understand that some of your members are a part of various caucus groups with the intention of working on environmental and climate action. For example, uh, the Conservative Climate Caucus, which is, um, you know, continuing to uh, increase their number of members and in increasing the uh, participation. Um, going into messages that don't resonate with these members, um, I think uh, messaging uh, that explicitly pits clean energy against fossil fuels is one thing that I would uh, personally not bring up. Um, and I think that, uh, you guys should not bring up in general in future meetings. Um, and also um, trying to resale, resale the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, you don't want to kind of relitigate the IRA, um, but it is uh, important in the future um, that to remind them of the benefits of the individual climate provisions of the bill. Um, I think just mentioning kind of the uh, reconciliation process in general is not is a message that won't be received well. Um, going in to what is our ask and goal with House Republican members, uh, going back to what I mentioned earlier about supporting ask uh, is probably number one, 
uh, particularly the Growing Climate Solutions Act and the National Climate Adaptation and Resilience Strategy Act, or NCARS. Um, through, through the Growing Climate Solutions Act, it has passed the Senate, um, and now we need to get it through the House. Um, there has been some Republican opposition to the bill, which is why we need stronger outreach to Republicans uh, to gain more co-sponsors. Uh, long term, we want them thinking about the implications on U.S. trade as more global economies adopt carbon prices and uh, border adjustments. Our next ask and goal is to uh, build the clean energy economy faster and what the federal government can do to speed up this process. Um, next, uh, in terms of asking our goal, uh, we also need to focus on getting many of these members to a no vote to, re to prevent repeal of climate progress will be the greatest of important, importance over the next, next decade as well. Um, so if uh, potentially there is a uh, opportunity to repeal uh, what was in the IRA, um, we need to have met these House members uh, vote no against it. Um, no matter who holds the reign of power, uh, we need to make sure that we have a strong bipartisan coalition that will block any effort to move us backwards in our climate goals. Um, next, uh, every po positive step on climate legislation makes uh, the next one easier. Uh, we want to continue to move towards a, a world where both Democrats and Republicans are working to advance solutions that reduce emissions, draw out greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere and build the low carbon economy we need. Um, so that is all in terms of the ask that I have. Um, That's it. We're just so thankful that you're here and that you're interested in lobbying. And as always with anything liaison related, you can always reach out to Keston or I. Keston is K-E-S-T-E-N at citizensclimate.org. And I am Amy, A-M-Y at citizensclimate.org. We're always happy to set up a time to chat with you if you have some questions. And um, thanks again for coming. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.